This is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. You know, the sacred scriptures of East and West do not found a religion, they tell a history of a people, a mighty people. The English-speaking peoples of the world figure in the descent of one of the twelve tribes, the descendants of Joseph. Joseph, as you recall, was the son of Jacob, the patriarch. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob had twelve sons, and so twelve tribes were formed. Joseph, you remember, was the favorite. They were all jealous of him because he was the one who had the coat of many colors. He was sold into Egypt. Well, he had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and so Jacob accepted those as his own, and they became two half-tribes. And these half-tribes figure in our destiny, yours and mine. But this is getting a little bit ahead of myself. I want to talk about the history, our history, as we have been evolving upon this planetary home, not for thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, but millions. It is sometimes a bitter pill to swallow, this concept of reincarnation and karma, this teaching I bring you. I was reading about the seventh angel who comes and when he begins to sound, the mysteries of God are finished. And that seventh angel that is recorded in the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation is to me our own beloved Saint Germain, who was the prophet Samuel, one of his incarnations, and was Saint Germain as Saint Joseph, the husband of Mary and the protector of Jesus. It's a very interesting thing how he is the key to our lives today and how he was the key in ancient times. So we read in the book of Revelation of the little book and John said it is sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. It may be sweet to contemplate the evolution of the soul and the law of reincarnation but the bitterness in the belly is the law of accountability which our spiritual teachers bring to us. Those who have gone before us who are our elder brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ whom we love and adore not only as our Savior but also as the one who goes before us. Our brother on the path. So we discover that to embrace this teaching means to say we are responsible for more than today and yesterday. Our past goes back into the very mists of the new life on earth recorded in Genesis. So you see, in a very real sense, I see this Bible as the history of my soul and your soul, as we have participated age upon age with the great lights of history, and even before this book, and its records, the histories on the continent of India, which took from the motherland the ancient religions of the avatars. And so I would like to begin at the point of the renewed revelation of Almighty God to Moses, to a people who had forgotten the source and the light, a people who had strayed from the path in the old story of the Garden of Eden, and yet it was the going after those angels which fell, lost their first estate, and led the people of earth astray. Us in particular, you and me and our twin flames. Twin flames, you and your soulmate, the one who is the counterpart of yourself. Male and female created he them. We read in Genesis that Elohim created us in the image and likeness of God, male and female. So that is the story of creation in the central sun and on earth. And we're on a path and a quest to find who we are, this quest for the Holy Grail, and to find the other half of ourselves. 
So the sweet in the mouth is the great joy and light that we bring, that we discover the newness of the sacred fire. And the bitterness is that, yes, we must go through the travail of balancing our personal karma in order to give birth to the Christ within ourselves. We all have a manger of the heart. There the individual Christ is to be born, the same, the one, the universal Christ of Jesus. And of all who have returned to God, for it must be the same, since John said, that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And so we have a divine spark, and it has given to us the gift of the spoken word. Above all creatures, the spoken word is the power we have to be co-creators with God. This is the great message of the seventh angel of the book of Revelation and of the everlasting gospel. And so in this renewal of the ancient word, God appears to Moses and his angel appears in a bush, very common, any old bush. But the bush burned with a sacred fire and it was not consumed. And in the burning of that fire, the bush was no longer common. It became an extraordinary bush. And the voice of God spake out of this burning bush. This is the great mystery of ourselves when we are kindled with the fire of Almighty God and with that presence. All of a sudden, we are not merely flesh and blood, but we have the quickening of divine consciousness. And this is the where to and the why for of our evolution upon earth. It is that great moment when we are no longer the dead, but the quick, as the apostles spoke of it and as Jesus did before them. And so what happens? The Lord called unto Moses out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He was calling to his soul. He was quickening the ancient memory. Moses, who had come from God to save a mighty people and to save our souls. And Moses said, responding to that presence, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. The ground becomes hallowed because God is suddenly where you are, where I am. In this divine encounter, this mutual recognition, here is our source. We are the responsive one. We answer the call. We are ready for the quickening. And I believe that today the people of America and of Australia and of every nation have never been more ready for this divine quickening in the fullest sense of the word as it has been given to us in many times and situations in the history of these scriptures and of the ancient scriptures of the East. And so God says to Moses, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God is saying that to us today as clearly as he said it to Moses. We are afflicted by our own enslavement to materialism, to the burdens of war and nuclear power and plague and famine and terminal illnesses. And God knows our sorrows and he is here to heal us of all our diseases and to heal the planetary body if we will discover this key which he gave to Moses for us. And God says, I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. So the cry and the prayer of millions of people upon earth has been heard by God, and God is answering his people today through his Holy Spirit, through the presence of God with us, we can find the answers to 
these mammoth human problems which we have created, which defy human solutions, which only respond to the divine solution. And so God says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, out of the consciousness of death, out of the consciousness of the not-self, of the twilight zone of existence, out of the burden of their karma. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Do we not say that today? Who are we that can solve the world's problems? We are not the important people. We are not the powerful people. Who are we to offer ourselves as the instrument of the solution to global problems? Well, I will tell you who we are. We are the manifestation of that Almighty One. We are his issue. We are his offspring. We are his vessel. And if we will it so because it is our free will that is the catalyst, we can become the instrument. And this is the great heritage that comes down to us in our systems of government, down from Britain to both nations, the value of individual worth the value of the individual path and the individual spirit and what that spirit can do as one individual and as many. One of the greatest individuals who has ever lived on planet Earth came forth from Britain and his name is Francis Bacon and he delivered to us the science of the new age. He literally fashioned the modern mind and our receptivity to this 20th century one of the greatest figures that has ever come forth, and surely the greatest flower of all England. And to him we owe our spiritual scientific heritage. And therefore the worth of the individual must be paramount. God is an individual in the bush that is burning. Moses is the individual, and together they change the course of history. You can change the course of history of your individual life, your families, your children, and when you accomplish that, you move out to your community and your nation. And one times one times one equals millions of individuals who are standing in the light of this same extraordinary burning bush. And God said, Certainly I will be with thee. Certainly I will be with thee. This is what he says to you in this hour. These promises are for all of the seed who has come down from the Ancient of Days. Will you challenge it? Will you doubt it? Will you deny it? Nay, nay, because it is holy ground, for you are his instrument. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain, upon this plane of consciousness, this understanding that I, the Lord thy God, manifest myself to you as a personal presence who will walk and talk with you. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Moses knew they wouldn't believe him if he couldn't tell them his name. What was he like? Who is he? What is the special virtue? What is the name of God who will deliver us? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is your key. You must discover the way to be sent by your I am presence, the presence of God with you, the name is I am that I am. That is the affirmation of being. It means I will be who I will be. I will reveal myself in the course of events. In the long stream of history, you will know me by my actions, by my intercession, by my working through you. You will know me when you hear my words speak through your mouth and when you feel the voice of conscience within you, you will discover who is this Emmanuel, this God with us. 
And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The memorial to all generations. It is the memory. It is the keepsake. It is the key. It is the name of the Lord that is given to us, whereby we unlock the power of that presence. And so God has promised to visit us and to deliver us of our afflictions. I would like to show you now a chart of this I am that I am that we have diagrammed for your understanding. This is a very interesting chart because it is a pictorial representation of that which is three-dimensional and four-dimensional. It is something that in the subconscious memory of your being you are already aware of. The I am that I am which spake to Moses is depicted as the upper figure in the chart. It is the presence of the Father surrounded by these spheres of light which we call electronic rings of light. They are pulsating from the center outward. Often in a vision you will find recorded in scripture that people see an angel with a rainbow upon his head. This is recorded in the book of Revelation. It is the sign of the presence of the Lord. And the seven color rays represent the potential of God which you can draw down to yourself as you are represented as the lower figure in this chart. The lower figure is depicted in the supplicant mode, the hands reaching out, cupped to receive the light. And the violet flame which surrounds the lower figure is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual light. It's the light of freedom. The spiritual light is the seventh ray of the seventh age, the age of Aquarius, which we are now entering. It is a very high vibrating frequency and you can see it in the aura of those who are spiritually inclined, who are freedom fighters, who are definitely attuned to recovering world freedom in every way, economically, politically, in the arts, in the sciences. Now in the center of the chart there is another figure and that figure comes down to us in the prophecy of the prophet Jeremiah. I would like to speak to you about that one, taking it from his very text. Jeremiah came preaching of the restoration, and he sent forth the Lord's judgment unto the pastors, and he said, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, and I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel, which are the twelve tribes, and they shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called. This king, this one who is to become the guide unto all of us, is called the Lord our righteousness. And these words are all capitalized in the book of Jeremiah. The Lord our righteousness. Now if you see the middle figure in that chart, it is like the figure of Christ. It is the mediator between God, who is pure spirit, of whom Habakkuk said, Thou art of 
too pure eyes to behold iniquity. The God who is in the central sun, who is that pure perfection, is not aware of imperfection. So the lower figure in the chart ourselves, we find ourselves in this veil of sin, of karma, of imperfection, of relative good and evil. We need an advocate before the Father. This advocate came to us in the very person of the Son, Jesus Christ, to save us as it is taught from the going forth from Eden, that pure perfection of paradise. Now that mediator is in fact the universal Christ. The mediator acts within us as our conscience. The Lord our righteousness means we know the way of right and wrong according to this Lord and this presence, this inner voice. This inner voice speaks to us regardless of custom, regardless of tradition or society's mores which change from decade to decade. The Lord our righteousness is the plumb line of truth whereby we know what is right action and we automatically feel the sense of wrong action and the sense of sorrow which issues from it. So in fact the chart shows that we are a trinity in manifestation. We have the presence of the Father, the lawgiver, the one who is all light. We have the presence of the Son, the Lord, our righteousness. And we ourselves are intended to be the temple of the living God. Know ye not that your temple is the temple of the living God. The Holy Spirit is intended to fill this temple and when we cleanse and purify it and when we enter into the joy of the Lord, God is joyous to take up his abode with us. So this is the meaning of this wondrous chart and it is the message that came to Moses upon Horeb. In fact, if you look at the shape of it, it looks like a tree, like the tree of life. It also looks like a bush and you realize that you are intended to glow from that tree of life and in the very center the crystal cord comes down and John saw it as the river of life. And so we have the river of life flowing through us. That is what beats our heart. That is what puts all systems go and we are born. The mighty action of this presence. There is only one God. There is only one Christ begotten of him. And this presence of the Father and the Son are duplicated wherever God has created his offspring. This understanding of the universal Christ personified and individualized with us gives us the understanding of our goal because we are intended to become the integration of the three. John the Beloved, the closest disciple of Jesus said that if we love God and obey his commandments, the Father and the Son will take up their abode with us. This chart shows how this takes place. God says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. Through meditation, through prayer, through dynamic decrees, through love and service to life, to our fellow man, to our families, we increase our awareness to God and this I am presence and Christ self are not so far away and they begin to merge with the outer self and this is why Jesus was so special because the Lord dwelt in him the Father and the Son were one and therefore we call him Jesus the Christ and Christ means the anointed Jesus the Son of Man was anointed with the light of the I am presence which descended as the Christ and the two were one and there was no difference we saw the human and the divine as one person and we said hail Lord we said lo Jesus the Christ the one sent he is Lord he is the manifestation of the I am presence which appeared to Moses on Horeb and therefore the Old and the New Testament become one and we see the traditions are one and the same and meant as a gift to all people of all nations. Now Jeremiah who gave this prophecy was a very unique individual. It is written in the book of Jeremiah that God sent him to all of the kingdoms of the earth, even to the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea. Those isles are the British Isles. And so there is a tradition 
that Jeremiah migrated with a band of Israelites and that they are known to have reached the British Isles. According to this tradition, he carried with him the Bethel stone, symbolic of the throne of David. Bethel means the place of God in Hebrew. You will remember that Jacob wrestled with the angel and he saw the angels ascending and descending the place of God, the place where he perceived God, Bethel. And he said to this angel who wrestled with him, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. If you chance to meet an angel and he loves you enough to wrestle with that carnal mind, with that human consciousness, with that doubt and fear, wrestle with him and don't let him go until you receive that blessing as Jacob did. Now this very Bethel stone is the coronation stone upon which the kings of the house of David were crowned. And God promised Jeremiah that David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. We can see that throne in an outer sense and an inner sense. In the inner sense of the divine spark, the throne becomes the three in one of a threefold flame, the threefold flame of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which is in our hearts as a divine spark. So each one has the throne in himself where Christ is ensconced and seated, but we're also talking about an outer throne. Well, what happened was that all of the male heirs of the house of David were killed at the time of Zedekiah. And so the seed was carried by Zedekiah's daughters, who are said to have migrated with Jeremiah to the British Isles to initiate the royal lineage in Ireland. According to Irish, Scottish, and English documents, the kings of Ireland and Scotland were crowned on that stone, and today that very stone, known as the Stone of Scone, sits under the throne at Westminster Abbey, where the kings of England are crowned. So it is a very interesting heritage which we have, we of the United States who have come from Britain, we of Australia who have come from Britain. It goes back all the way back to that stone which goes back to Jeremiah, which goes back to Jacob and Bethel. And so we understand that there are ancient traditions that sponsor our reason for being. Now that reason for being has seen us deriving our common heritage, evolving our individual experiments in freedom, and that freedom is the right of free will given by that presence of God, whereby we forge and win a God government prophesied by Isaiah who said, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and that is the shoulder of that universal Christ, that Lord, our righteousness. When we do right, we can attribute it to our attunement with that mediator. And when we do wrong, we learn quickly from our karma and the lessons of wrong action. And so building on British traditions of rule of law, the United States derived its constitution based on a government of limited power, deriving its authority from the consent of the people. The Commonwealth government here in Australia was patterned on Britain and partly on the United States Constitution. In this century, we have fought four wars together. American soldiers, Australian soldiers, side by side. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. We must be united to bring peace and freedom to the world. It is my profound belief that the flame of freedom of the world has to be ignited from America, from Australia, from those who have a common destiny in the descent of the British Empire. Along with our heritage of freedom have come the evils to which this planet is heir. But we who have a common understanding and a common sense of destiny must unite in defeat of the common enemies of man, which are hatred, revenge, war, famine, plague, pestilence, and deprivation, and especially the deprivation of the human spirit and its divine inheritance. I'd like to talk to you about the traditions of Great Britain, which indicate that Joseph, another Joseph, 
of Arimathea brought the boy Jesus to the British Isles where he studied. I'd like to talk to you about the book that I've written that is available for you about Jesus going to the Far East between the ages of 13 and 29, 17 years studying in India. I'd like to talk to you about what he has brought back to us and what is the knowledge of the path of individual Christhood, the individual realization of our potential in God that we need to face our personal problems, our personal karma, and the challenges that we face together as nations. I'd like to show you your inner spiritual reality on these slides, which shows the chakras. The teachings of the chakras, of course, were known by Jesus, and they are taught in India. These are spiritual centers of light in the body. The teachings of the ascended masters of the Great White Brotherhood show us how to release the light of the seven chakras and therefore to increase higher consciousness. So we expand the light of the heart through mantra. And that's why this little booklet is called I Am the Light of the Heart. The reason I gave you the story of Moses, the name of God I Am, is an affirmation of God's being where you are. And it is only God's being that can release the light to solve the East-West conflict. There is no point in the spirit of prophecy unless we solve all of the world's problems. If it doesn't work, then we shouldn't be studying it. It is not separated from the conditions at hand. Now, I would like to invite you to release the light of your heart. In this little book, I Am the Light of the Heart, you will see this affirmation. It was given to me by Saint Germain. Saint Germain as the prophet Samuel. Saint Germain as Saint Joseph. Today, we do not go to our churches and synagogues and find that our pastors tell us what the meaning of this word is and that when we say the name of God, I am, as soon as we say it, the light comes forth. It releases the light of the heart. It is the affirmation of God's being. So when you say, I am the light of the heart in this mantra on page one of this little book, you're saying, God in me is the light of the heart. God where I am is the light of my heart. It's important to affirm that because the light of God in its realm of perfection remains above us until we by free will call it forth. This is the law of God. If we want God to intercede, we need to speak his name and call forth his light and qualify it according to free will. When you pray for healing someone, your, your free will is saying, God, please come and heal this person by your power. So we use the science of affirmation, the affirmation of the word I am. And I, I'm going to repeat this. If you'd like to join me, you can give it with me and feel and experience what the repetition of an affirmation does for you. It's page one, the bottom of the page. I am the light of the heart, shining in the darkness of being and changing all into the golden treasury of the mind of Christ. I am projecting my love out into the world to erase all errors and to break down all barriers. I am the power of infinite love, amplifying itself until it is victorious, world without end. I am the light of the heart, shining in the darkness of being and changing all into the golden treasury of the mind of Christ. I am projecting my love out into the world to erase all errors and to break down all barriers. I am the power of infinite love, amplifying itself until it is victorious, worlds without end. Now there's a great science to the simple repetition of a prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a tremendous release of light to us. And if you will note, it is the same science, the technique of speaking to the Father and asking his light to do th certain things. The Lord's Prayer is actually a command of the light descending through our crystal cord to act in our life. If you will say it with me, you will hear it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a command. Let thy name be sacred. Thy kingdom come. It's a command to God. By free will, we are saying, I elect to have God's kingdom manifest where I am. I believe that the kingdom of God is his consciousness. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Every sentence that I have said is the command of the lower figure in the chart, you and me, unto the Father, said through the heart of the Son who gave us that prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now when I say that, I am affirming that where I am, God is, and where I am, his is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. I give to him all that I am, and I ask him to occupy my temple, to feed me, to forgive me, to lead me from temptation. So God taught us through Jesus the same command of the word. And he said, in this manner, pray ye. In this manner, pray ye. The manner is the technique and the way. It is the address to the Father, and it is the list of the command which we, as his sons and daughters, are advising him, are our best understanding of the use of his light and energy and consciousness in this octave where we live. Now, this science of energy is the science of being co-creators with God. We can form our own prayers according to this science. We can ask God to let his light descend for the binding of nuclear war, for the binding of east-west conflict, for the binding of the burden that is upon the Afghanistans or the Ethiopians or the people in Central America or the people in the ghettos of America or those who are burdened in your country. This is what I'm getting at with the knowledge of the I Am Presence. When you understand the source and that God has placed an all-powerful presence with us and given us the mediator and his wisdom to teach us and that we have a flame in our heart which gives the divine spark and gives the power of the spoken word, we begin to see that as we speak, the prayer, the mantra, the dynamic decree, change takes place. Now, one of the greatest agencies of change was delivered to us by St. Germain in the form of the violet flame. The violet flame is one aspect of the seven rainbow rays of your causal body, those rings of light surrounding the I Am Presence. It's the flame of freedom, and it is the freedom we need because in order to evolve, we have to exercise right choice. We can't exercise any choices if we are the victims of any totalitarian movement whatsoever, any tyranny. When governments or societies tell us what to do, what to think, how to live, we are losing the potential of free will. When we have an economic type of dictatorship, whatever the name might be, we are losing the God-given right of free determination of oneself. If we can't exercise that, we can't grow to realize our divine potential because we have to make mistakes in order to then take the right course. And that is the great grace of God, why we have a planet, an earth, and a universe, because we have to experiment with free will. I'd like to continue showing you a few slides. Now there's the symbol of our poster, and that shows what you really look like in your spiritual being if you are expanding the light in your seven centers. And physical fitness means spiritual fitness, and the spiritual body and the physical body must be as one. But there is a purpose to it, and that is the reason that I am concerned about international conditions because if we do not use the fruits of the spirit to solve global problems then what is the point of being a spiritual being are we going to be hermits are we going to be ascetics are we going to go and live in a cave are we just going to enjoy our spiritual attainment everything we gain from God is to give to others and we need to perceive who has the greatest need in the en entire totality of our ecosystem of our brothers and sisters in every nation and why they are being deprived of what they need physically so that they have a base to pursue a spiritual path. If people hunger and want, they're not interested in spiritual things. And so they will continue to vegetate for as long as we who have more allow it. Now the path that has been taught east and west by everyone who has ever united with God, every revolutionary of the spirit, whether they have been on a spiritual path or whether they have been liberators, is the path of the sacred heart. 
It is the development of the heart chakra because here is the fire of that heart. Now these are drawings that show us how we must protect the heart with spiritual light and how we must purify it. Jesus told us that in these last days that men's hearts would fail them for fear. There is great fear in the earth today. There is a great instance of heart attack and of course we know that comes from processed foods, pollution, as well as the karma of the age. The karma of the age is heavy. We are reaping the end of the Piscean cycle. That is the violet flame surrounding the heart and you have been given a booklet which is most useful in the daily washing, spiritually purifying of your chakras. It's called the Heart, Head and Hand Decrees. This is the visualization you would use for your heart when you call the violet flame around it. It's right inside this little book, page two. Here's how it goes. You can join me if you like. Violet fire, thou love divine, blaze within this heart of mine. Thou art mercy forever true. Keep me always in tune with you. Now that is a call to the violet flame. And what am I doing? As a son, as a daughter of God, I am saying, God, I am asking you to qualify the pure light descending from your presence to me today with the seventh ray of the violet flame because you have taught me, Saint Germain has showed me, that it is the light of the Holy Spirit for transmutation, that it does transmute karma, the burdens of the heart. The prophets speak of the hardness of the hearts of the people, when we are hardened toward one another, we build a great burden around the physical heart and the physical heart becomes weak and diseased. And this carries over from lifetime to lifetime. So because the heart is the central sun of our temple, the first goal we have when we come into a spiritual path is to make this heart pure and free of past karma of the misuses of its flame. This includes hatred, mild dislike, resentment, fear, doubt, and the, the quality of hardness. Everything that is a perversion of love because the heart is the center of love. So we do need the violet flame in our hearts and one of the mantras we like to give which uses the name of God is very simple and you can give it anywhere you are, silently or aloud in the shower when you're doing anything. It's a wonderful meditation and it goes this way. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. Again, the name I am, I'm really saying, God in me is a being of violet fire. God in me is the purity God desires. So by the great joy of the gift of free will and the power of speech that God has given to me, I may praise his name, I may call to him, I may ask him, for this glorious freedom flame and I may know that he has promised I will remember their sin no more. This is today's teaching of the prophet Jeremiah to that seed of Joseph come down through Ephraim and Manasseh through our mutual origins, through the reincarnation of that seed. And this great rejoicing and this great freedom is to build that momentum of the violet flame within our temples and Jeremiah says, I will write my law in their inward parts, and they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest, and they shall have no more fear, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, the violet flame has been referred to as the flame of forgetfulness because it erases karma, but it doesn't erase it permanently unless we permanently stop making karma. In other words, we are accountable. It's the wine of forgiveness, mercy, ritual, and the ritual of freedom. It is a tremendous action. I want you to know that I owe my own life and path to this presence of the Master Saint Germain and his gift of the violet flame. It has freed me from my own karma. It has enabled me to be delivered from many, many, many difficult situations. And I have seen it in the rejuvenation of my own four lower bodies. You have to be an alchemist like Saint Germain in the laboratory of your own temple. This body is your laboratory. You need to prove whether or not the violet flame works. You shouldn't believe me. You should decide to try it if you want to. 
and if you don't want to, you know you are exercising your free will. I am here only to tell you that this is the experience of one, and there are thousands more that have had the experience who rejoice to share it with you. Now the violet flame is visualized in the head and in the hand in this decree, and we can give the next two. This is the action of the head. You see the violet flame penetrating through the head and through your whole body. Then you make the affirmation. I am light, thou Christ in me. Set my mind forever free. Violet fire forever shine. Deep within this mind of mine. God who gives my daily bread with violet fire. Fill my head till thy radiance heaven-like makes my mind a mind of light. This is the visualization for the hand. Now you see heart, head, and hand. When we say, I am the hand of God in action, we're saying, God in me is the hand of God in action. Our desire is to be his instrument in all of our members. Together. I am the hand of God in action, gaining victory every day. My pure soul's great satisfaction is to walk the middle way. Then you can step up the mantra. I am the hand of God in action, gaining victory every day. My pure soul's great satisfaction is to walk the middle way. I am the hand of God in action, gaining victory every day. My pure soul's great satisfaction is to walk the middle way. Now I would like to tell you that by the grace of God and my personal application, as I've been giving these decrees for about 24 years, since 1961, I do have a momentum on giving them. And as a result, when I begin to give them, I hear in my inner ear the sound of a rushing water, like a mighty waterfall descending around me. I feel and see the presence of the violet flame enveloping my form. Now the fact is that I've said this decree so many times that it has become a process which my chakras go through more quickly than when I first began. So we'll take the first page together, all of us, three times each. Violet fire, thou love divine, blaze within this heart of mine. Thou art mercy forever true, keep me always in tune with you. Violet fire, thou love divine, blaze within this heart of mine. Thou art mercy forever true, keep me always in tune with you. Violet fire, thou love divine, blaze within this heart of mine. Thou art mercy forever true, keep me always in tune with you. I am like thou Christ in me, set my mind forever free. Violet fire forever shine deep within this mind of mine. God who gives my daily bread with violet fire, fill my head till thy radiance heaven light makes my mind a mind of light. I am like the Christ in me, set my mind forever free. Violet fire forever shine deep within this mind of mine. God who gives my daily bread with violet fire, fill my head till thy radiance heaven light makes my mind a mind of light. I am the hand of God in action, gaining victory every day. My pure soul's great satisfaction is to walk the middle way. I am the hand of God in action, gaining victory every day. My pure soul's great satisfaction is to walk the middle way. I am the hand of God in action, gaining victory every day. My pure soul's great satisfaction is to walk the middle way. Now this is the mighty tube of light. The tube of light comes down from your I am presence, surrounds your form, gives you tremendous protection from the mass consciousness, from, as, is, as it is said, arrows of outrageous fortune, uh, criticisms of the mind, emotions that are base, uh, whatever the race is heir to. We seal ourselves in a tube of light because the spiritual path changes force field and consciousness and requires a sealing action because the world is like a dry sponge and it desires to, to devour that light. So when you walk the path, you must have protection, and you cannot make any more progress on the path than you have protection. So your mantras are for your protection. We always stand, and many times we stand before the chart of the presence which we keep. 
So I'd like you to learn this little mantra of the tube of light. If you would care to stand, you may do so. Use the power of your vision. Use the power of your vision to see the white light all around you like a giant milk bottle. It goes underneath your feet. It protects you and seals you completely as long as you are harmonious. When you become inharmonious, you have to invoke it again. Together. Beloved, I am presence bright. Round me seal your tube of light. From ascended master flame, called forth now in God's own name. Let it keep my temple free from all discord sent to me. I am calling forth violet fire to blaze and transmute all desire, keeping on in freedom's name till I am one with a violet flame. Beloved, I am presence bright. Round me seal your tomb of light. From ascended master flame, call forth now in God's own name. Let it keep my temple free from all discord sent to me. I am calling forth violet fire to blaze and transmute all desire, keeping on in freedom's name till I am one with the violet flame. Beloved, I am presence bright. Round me seal your tube of light. From ascended master flame, called forth now in God's own name. Let it keep my temple free from all discord sent to me. I am calling forth violet fire to blaze and transmute all desire, keeping on in freedom's name till I am one with a violet flame. That tube of light is putting on your spiritual garment every morning. It's just like getting dressed. It's your spiritual garment. The very first action of spiritual qualification must be forgiveness. We all need the law of forgiveness, and that's another action of the violet flame. And here we see and visualize a thought form. A thought form is an image. This image is a sphere of violet flame that has wings. We are sending mercy and forgiveness to all of life on earth everywhere from our hearts by the science of the spoken word. And we say, God in me is forgiveness acting here. Think of all whom you have ever wronged and all who have ever wronged you. Send currents of love as this visualization of forgiveness. I am forgiveness acting here, casting out all doubt and fear, setting men forever free with wings of cosmic victory. I am calling in full power for forgiveness every hour to all life in every place. I flood forth forgiving grace. You can confess to Almighty God in the person of your I Am Presence and Christ Self. Your Christ Self is the High Priest of your temple who officiates at the altar of the heart. And so confession is a very necessary part of our psychology. We call to God for forgiveness and we affirm in ourselves that we will go and sin no more. The violet flame erases the record, delivers the blessing to the one we have wronged, and this is how we move forward on the progress of life. This is the visualization of those violet flame spheres going into every home in Sydney, every home throughout Australia. The mercy of God is descending, and we all know how grace and mercy brings the sense of love and springtime to our families and loved ones once again. Here the violet flame spheres cover the earth, they bring comfort to those in distress and a universal understanding which we need. Now you must have the violet flame inside the tube of life, which is active 24 hours a day, bringing transmutation to everything in your consciousness. Transmutation is an alchemy of exalting. Hatred becomes love, error becomes truth. The violet flame changes the human into the divine. Jesus did this at the marriage at Cana. He changed the water into wine. He declared his mission was to change the elements of water, the human consciousness, into the wine of the spirit. So I'd like to leave you with the great thought that if we do not solve our problems of pollution, of the economy, of war, of plague, and illnesses we cannot cure, we will not have a base for the spiritual path. And this is why we come full circle. We may retreat from the world, discover the mysteries and the teachings, but when we find God, we have to go back to the valleys and bring this light, because we know that when our children are being destroyed by drugs, 
or when foreign agents are destroying our economies, that we cannot rest because our people are in distress. And the heart is that we care for people everywhere and that we must extend our light to them to meet them in their position of oppression. And that's where our teaching began this evening. God contacts Moses to deliver people from their enslavement in Egypt. Millions of people are enslaved today by totalitarian governments. And even in the free nations, we are enslaved by this or that encroachment. And there's less territory in the world today than, than is free than that which is enslaved. So we believe that through the violet flame and through the work, work of the masters, this can be rolled back and we do not have to submit to another dispensation of dark ages, but that the world can move into a golden age because our hearts become one and perform the service of the masters. God bless you and good evening. been watching The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. The preceding program has been presented through the assistance of Church Universal and Triumphant. Box A, Livingston, Montana, 59047, 1390. If you would like to know more, call this number or write this address. For a catalog and information on the full-length version of this and other videotapes on Prophecy, The Lost Teachings of Jesus, and St. Germain, call this toll-free number, 1-800-323-5228.